Hello and welcome everyone on behalf of Interfish Media, our partner Biomar and our sponsor Panafaird to our latest Interfish Digital event. Today we'll be discussing the need for feed, feed, feed sector's growing role in aquaculture's future. And we have a fantastic lineup of panelists. It's an interesting day uh, in the world. So we very much appreciate people taking time out of their schedule. Uh, and maybe we'll give you an hour and a half to not think about politics. So aquaculture's role in the global protein supply has only gotten more important. There is a dramatic need for protein and that will only grow. And aquaculture is well positioned to do that in a sustainable way. Uh, and of course, wild feed will continue to have a important role as well. At the intersection of that is the aquaculture feed sector. And today we're going to be discussing that uh, over the course of the next hour or so. And, uh, and we'll be touching on a range of topics from fish health to sustainability, to novel ingredients, to, uh, to uh, a range of other things, including the consumers. We have a, a great panel, as I mentioned, we'll be introducing those in a bit. Um, but to start us off, I am pleased to welcome to the virtual stage, Elizabeth Awesome. She's the R&D and Fish Health Director at Biomar. Elizabeth, if you could take the virtual stage and get us started, that would be fantastic. So let me know when you can see my screen and I will be ready to give my talk. We can, we can see you and you're ready to go and we can hear you just okay. fine. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Interfish and Drew, for, for the introduction and for this opportunity. Um, I'm a fish health biologist of profession, so I really feel the importance of, of highlighting health whenever I discuss aquaculture with my colleagues out there, being fish or shrimp. So um, for this talk now today, I am sorry, because um, because I'm representing the the global R and D team in Biomar, and we are supporting customers and networks all over the world. Uh, we we develop feeds for from multitudes of species and farming conditions and markets. But one thing that we all have as an industry have in common is is caring for our animals. And in this presentation, I want to bring the focus toward health to confirm the, its importance and as well how feed can contribute to supporting welfare and a sustainable future. Because sustainability is very much linked to fish health. Um, the impact of fish loss on our value chain is illustrated in this table. The numbers are prepared by, by the biosustain team um, and based on Norwegian, a Norwegian scenario of, of salmon in seawater. Still, this scenario can be transferred to most aquaculture markets. So bring your eyes to the left side of this table. You can actually see how fish loss is present, presented as a, as a carbon footprint, a number that we all are very eager to reduce. So losing animals has a significant environmental cost. Hiding fish loss is an everyday battle and requires our full attention. Since being a fish surrounded by water is tough and swimming in a pool of billions of creatures that potentially could cause a lot of harm and with fluctuating temperatures and oxygen, allergies and storms, and last but not least, will farming always demand some handling, like treatments and grading and net cleaning. We need to be aware that the fish will always choose surviving before growth. If we aren't able to support health, the growth and performance will be compromised. But good news, the fish actually has excellent tools to survive under these challenging conditions. Um, starting with the outer shield, oh, sorry, that was, yeah, starting with the outer shield um, that is covering all surfaces that is in direct contact with the water and the skin, the intestines and the gills. Compared to us humans with our dry skin surface, 
fish actually have live skin cells covered with protective mucus and armored by solid scales. The mucus layer contains chemicals and immune cells and good bacteria, the microbiota, that can stop and, uh, and combat harmful pathogens. All the fish surfaces are actually connected, meaning that a good gut health will influence good skin health and vice versa. So how can Biomar as a feed supplier support this, this excellent toolbox and enable the fish to grow and thrive? Welfare is absolutely a long-term commitment and focus, beginning with the start feeding of the smallest fish. Where feed and good nutrition is part of the toolbox, together with other management measures. As a feed supplier, we need to control and, and utilize aspects like physical pellet properties, raw material compositions, nutrient demands, as well as having access to functional components targeting health. Our diet range is quite extensive and, and, and uh, we are always ready to discuss diet options and, and health strategies with our partners and customers. But it is important that we are in front of the challenges uh, to gain the best results. A healthy gut is crucial for good nutrition uptake and growth, which is very easy to understand. Um, but as highlighted earlier in this talk, the intestine is part of the animal's external surface and barrier. So it needs to be intact to protect the fish from pathogens and infections, and to ensure that we can handle environmental changes and handling. Within the fish intestine, we can find bacteria that are linked to the gut wall. It's called the microbiota, as we have in humans. Though the fish microbiota is under larger external pressure than land animals due to that the intest the, the due to the in intimate contact with with water environment. We know that these bacteria are vital for the fish, helping with digestion, regulating metabolism, development of the intestines gut integrity and disease defense. It is a growing field of investigation to understand even better the importance of the gut uh, bacteria and the effect uh, on the health and performance. And new data is being published every day, so it's quite exciting. So using probiotics or live lactic acid bacteria to support the gut health is known from human health. Like, uh, like the doctors ordering us to eat pro probiotics, supplements, and yogurt to prevent to to present them prevent us upset stomach. For a while now, probiotics has as well been available for aquaculture through feed or water treatments. And by combining probiotics with specific nutrients for bacteria called prebiotics, we are able to have the best effects. This combination is called symbiotic. As for humans, we're able to actually see that using probiotics is, uh, is stabilizing the, the microbiota and shifting it to be more healthy and more healthy contents. The picture is from a, it's, uh, it's from a published study, study that we, where we looked at microbiota during the seawater transfer of Atlantic salmon which is a significant environmental change for the fish and where the smolt needs to be to be to almost re-establish its microbiota going into seawater. The green areas on this uh, picture is, uh, a rep is representing the bacteria that, are be that we are able to change with probiotics in the diet and it is, it is largely represented by lactic acid bacteria. So we know that we can affect survival and performance with a positive, uh, in a positive way with, with feeds. Because in addition to the local effects in the gut, the, protective, uh, the positive contributions are reaching beyond the surface and are giving a systemic effect leading to better welfare and performance. I want to show you some examples. So I reached into the, uh, our documentation library and I picked two recent trials targeting critical life stages within the fish farming. 
on the left, it's start feeding of tiny marine larvae, where we can see that presenting a well-formulated diet with healthy with, with health ingredients early, we're able to reduce deformities by 75%. On the right-hand side, transfer of salmon from fresh water to sea is a challenging and it can take time until fish is fully adopted to the new environment. During this period, the risk is high to develop wounds and loose fish. But using transfer diets, including the pre and probiotics, before and after seawater transfer, we have been able to see improved growth. A growing fish is a good sign of a healthy fish. So these are just some of our documentation, but feel free to reach out to our sales and biofarm team uh, and we can give you more information if you want that. The focus on animal welfare is growing steadily, including in the aquaculture industry. So welfare indicators are being now developed across fish species and implemented as guidelines for the industry and authorities and, and consumers. Decreasing loss is very much a team effort where we need to support, push and motivate each other. And caring for our fish, I believe is the key to a sustainable industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. I really appreciate how you've uh, laid out the day. Uh, and it's a perfect intro into uh, our first discussion, which is going to be about fish health. So you please stay on while we introduce the rest of the panel and get the discussion going. So as I said, we have a fantastic panel uh, in addition to Elizabeth. If you want to see their very impressive resumes, you can go to Intrafish events. So uh, for the sake of time, we're going to move forward and I'm not going to read these uh, long, uh, these long accomplishments that all these, uh, all these panelists have. So uh, if you could please turn on your webcams and microphones, uh, I'll be introducing Harold Speyer. He's a technical manager with Leroy Seafood Group. Isla Jones, she's the fisheries and aquaculture manager at UK retailer Co-op. Pierce Hart, he's a global aquaculture lead at WWF and Project X. And Mathieu Castex, he's the global R&D director at Lalamond Animal Nutrition. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm very excited to have this panel and uh, and excited for all the great topics we're gonna uh, we're gonna be hitting on. Uh, a little bit of house cleaning for our audience out there. So if you look up in the upper right hand side of your corner, uh, you can see an area where you can ask questions. So there is the possibility to to um, send questions in while the event is going on. And then my colleague Demi Corbin is able to look at those and pending time, we'll uh, ask a few of those. So please, by all means, uh, ask questions, make comments. Anything we can't get to, uh, um, please just let us know in Intrafish and, uh, and we'll add it to our long list of things to, to cover. So um, Elizabeth, um, as I said, you started us off on fish health. Um, and that's a great place to start and that intersection of fish health and sustainability. Um, but Harold, I want to go to you first because I want to uh, give our audience a little bit of a scope of how feed has changed uh, and the, uh, the expectations of feed over, say, the past 10 and 20 years and what feed can or can't do. Uh, when you see um, experts like Elizabeth um, speaking, you just you finally get a sense of the amount of work that goes into uh, developing these feeds for uh, for fish health. But Harl, tell us a bit. Uh, feed is a very expensive. It's a very large cost of uh, for Leroy. So what are your expectations and how have those changed over the past 10, 15 years? Thank you. Yeah, feed is very expensive. Co accounts for about 50% of production costs. So um, we are following the feed market and uh, biomar very closely. When you look at the changes in the feed, it's a changes of the use of raw materials going from a high marine inclusion to a high vegetable uh, raw materials inclusion. And that is driven by two main factors. Factors, I think. First of all, price, the price of the different raw materials, 
uh, and everyone is fighting for uh, as low price as possible com um, uh, combined with uh, the best performance. And the second driver, I think it's uh, sustainability. At the moment, we have a huge discussion now go going on on MSC certification of blue whiting, which is, uh, seems that blue whiting is uh, losing its uh, certification and, and we think that's, that's really bad. Uh, and it's not driven by the fish farming industry or the fish meal industry, but it's the, the uh, coastal states that can't agree on the quota, which in the end means that they are overfishing and by that losing the MSC certification. So, so the, the focus on, on sustainability, the focus on the CO2 uh, footprint uh, and so on is become more and more important. The challenge with all that is of course to get paid for the effort we and Biomar and the other feed suppliers are putting into having a more sustainable feed resources. Well, and we're gonna we're gonna ask that uh, question of uh, Isla as well, and what what uh, what we can do to have consumers understand the importance of sustainability in feed, and how to get them um, to realize that's an important part of of uh, the purchase that they're making. So, Harl, just to stay with you though, on fish health, um, how has feed improved uh, profitability, improved? Uh, reduction of mortalities uh, for Leroy over the, the course of the past uh, 20 years. Um, how have those developments helped from a uh, from a uh, uh, efficiency and profitability standpoint? Yeah, well, I don't have a straightforward answer for, for that because uh, the, the, um, the issues about fish health has been come, become more and more serious as time, as the years has gone, gone past. Uh, we have more mortality now than we have in the past. We have more different diseases, more wounds issues, and so on and so on. At the same time, the the, the raw material choices uh, made by the feed suppliers has also changed into more vegetable proteins. But as as Elizabeth pointed out, the the management of the farms, the fish density, the the, the total organic load, the total of bacterial load, virus load on these fishes has also changed it. So uh, I think we definitely need to really look into this: how to to um, to strengthen the fish by among other things, by, but by, by feed, by active components. Uh, Elizabeth was mentioning probiotics. Uh, Leroy is working with, with uh, fermented seaweed for land animal, uh, land living animals, uh, pig and uh, dairy cows, and, and have uh, significant good results on, on, on that. We are also working with fermented seaweed on, on, on fish and find a huge change in bacteria or the microbi microbiome in the gut of the or, or the fish. The next question is: Okay, we find a change, but what? But does it matter? How how do it inf really influence the, the 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 living of the fish? But in general, the environment has been changing. We as a farm had changing our operation. The density has been changed, and the feed has been changing. Um, if you I can assume that uh, the the change of the feed hasn't been to the to the better. It hasn't. Not, I'm not saying that it has been to the worst, but it's uh, definitely a need for more fish health focus on the feed. The feed is not a, not only a question about protein and fatty acids and so on. It's also a question about um, uh, health promoting components. So uh, advances in technology have come along also with advances, uh, well, I don't think you could call them advances, but with additional um, health issues, uh, increase in health uh, challenges. Uh, and we're gonna talk a little bit about those right now. Um, Mathieu, I'm gonna go to you a bit because um, your work um, kind of dovetails um, uh, with Biomar. Um, feed additives are having a, a more and more important role in fish health. So just um, moving off of Harold's uh, comments there, and the need for more development, tell us a little bit about what Lalamond is working on in terms of improving, um, playing a role in improving uh, fish feed and its impact on fish health. 
Yes, uh, first of all, yes, I will uh, definitely agree with what has been said. There is definitely a need for more research and more commitment from uh, all the stakeholders in, in the industry to, to invest in research to, to, to find ways to improve fishers. And now the, the question about the assessment of, of the, the impact on profitability is, is I think, not an easy one, uh, as highlighted by Harald. Um, I would say that from our perspective, we are looking at it through different angles. Um, the first one being the most uh, obvious one and uh, linked to what Elizabeth explained, I mean, reducing fish losses and mortality, which of course direct impact on profit and sustainability. Um, but there is also um, emerging work showing that additives and in particular um, controlling the microbiome uh, may have impact on the resilience and robustness of the animals, in particular uh, if applied at young stages. And this may translate into Okay, lower losses or better growth. And the effect on growth can certainly be uh, modelized to, to assess the impact on, on profitability. Uh, in particular, looking at younger stage, it's probably easy to, to start with. And, and finally, um, there is also additional values or what we could call soft benefit, let's say, that can also be sick with, uh, with such a type of, of additives. And this is certainly linked to animal welfare, environmental impact, and, and also potentially food safety from, from uh, livestock uh, animals. We, we see that. However, the difficulty, if I take the example of food safety, for instance, um, I just have an example with chicken, which is a, a bit far away from aquaculture, but it can tell about the challenges we are facing. Uh, we, in our case, have documented some probiotic effect on, on food safety. Or we, to Salmonella, Campylobacter, etc. There's even some claim registered in EU, but then uh, it attracted a lot of interest, but the difficulty is still to pass on part of the cost to the rest of the value chain. So I, I think this is also something we should uh, take into account when, when developing uh, those kind of products, is uh, addressing the value it brings to the entire value chain rather than to focus only on one part of the, of the, of the chain. Uh, and the last comment I will make is uh, that uh, even though the functional feed concept, I think, has really developed and and, uh, and and the uptake of it uh, has been growing in, in, in salmon, for example, but also in, in, in other marine fish in, in Europe, I think we should not forget the other parts of the world and in other uh, area uh, in Asia or other places where shrimp production or freshwater fish are produced to a large extent. Uh, we still see that this concept is, uh, is at its infant, infancy. Uh, there is still a lot of things to do. And uh, this may be explained by the management and the, the attitude of, uh, at the farm level, you know, farmer relying a lot of, uh, on farm input. Um, other people will argue that there is a lot of things to address uh, in terms of management uh, before to, to look at uh, functional diet and costly diet. Well, this is certainly true, but I will however mitigate this comment because uh, this is sometimes, not always, but sometimes under those situations that actually functionality may yield the strongest effect. So uh, it's just to give the perspective also from uh, from other type of production than, than salmon or marine fish uh, in Europe. So, you know, I, I, I'm curious from you, Elizabeth, just um, continuing off of what Mathieu just said. So, um, you know, Harold said there's a need to invest more, uh, do more research on fish health, um, and obviously that goes to, um, as Matthew said, marine fish, uh, saltwater fish, and shrimp as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, I'm curious, kind of looking from the feed side, um, are companies um, understanding the amount of research that goes uh, into these issues, and are they willing to pay for it? So when Biomar puts all of this uh, time, effort, uh, and research into these um, uh, into these projects into fish health, ultimately that half, that cost has to be carried across the value chain, correct? So um, how have companies been embracing uh, functional feeds? Mm. It is a struggle. It is a struggle. We are all focused on cost. As Harald as well, you know, we are all focused on cost and. Uh, um, but we need to be innovative, we need to search for new solutions, and we need to document them. So if there isn't a willingness 
to invest in this, it's going to be difficult for the long term. And and of course, we could focus on tomorrow uh, or the next next year, and we, we're going to be able to cope with that. But if we are having a long term focus and knowing that the aquaculture is actually going to be one of the main sources of food in the future, we need to be willing to invest. So, yeah. Okay, so let's talk, uh, let's drill down a little bit on the actual diseases and issues themselves, because I, I've been very fascinated to see um, some of the research coming out, um, primarily out of Norway and Scotland, um, on um, issues like sea lice. Um, so Elizabeth, can you talk a little bit about some of the progress on feed and how it can mitigate sea lice? Because certainly that, I'm sure, is the I, would, I don't want to say keep you up at night, Harold, but I'm sure it's something that crosses your mind probably every single day. So, Elizabeth, tell us about some of the advances that are happening in uh, in feed that are helping potentially mitigate uh, mitigate the sea lice issue, which is far and away for, for salmon farmers the, the biggest uh, challenge. Uh, yeah, we have talked about sea lice for, for ages, uh, from already when I did my education in 2001, finishing up. If we had a solution, I would have presented it, you know, but I, I don't think there's one single solution though to the sea lice problem. Parasites are difficult. Uh, there are there are quite advanced creatures. So, um, and feeds could contribute to part of this. Uh, when we talk about functional diets, what, what I'm, uh, I'm working with, it's not medication. So it will not kill the uh, the parasites, but it what we are focusing on is to uh, make the fish better capable of resisting it, being stronger. Because um, as I said in my presentation, they have the tools to survive. But it's important to be able to to help out. In, in, we have, we need to be in, in 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 front of the problems because when we have a very bad case of of sea lice it's it's difficult to to reduce that and another comment here is that um what is making it or what we need to have in our head as well when we when we think about sea lice management is the regulations that is uh, linked to sea lice keeping the sea lice level down because our pens are in the open sea so there are other fish there swimming and we need to be aware of that and it's as well part of being a sustainable industry so the regulations are they do put some demands on us uh, to keep the sea lice level really really low and again we we, we need to use being innovating in and use and, and work together again to to to, to keep uh, to keep that to keep that sea lice level to to the level that is it's uh, is re required and um and we are we are looking at sea lice uh we have ongoing trials and projects linked to this uh we we have interesting things uh looking ahead um, um and so there, there might be some things coming but yeah but again it's it's not going to be medication though the functional diets it's, so mm. it, it's about actually improving the uh improving the immune systems of the uh, the the fish and the biomass itself um matthew i'm going to go to you a little bit as well and, and if you could talk a bit about um some of the advances on the shrimp side because we have Primarily, um, you know, some, uh, salmon folks here. Um, but could you talk a little bit about um, Lalaman does work for all kinds of species? But um, and Elizabeth, feel free to jump in on here as well. But um, diseases uh, such as white spot, um, EMS, they can be absolutely devastating, and they can devastate crops very, very quickly. So. Any thoughts, Mathieu, on, on what are the advances right now and what can we expect from the research that's uh, happening that might help mitigate some of those issues uh, from the feed 
uh, and feed additives diet? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I will take the example of white spots, which is a long shot, right? Because we've been struggling with uh, white spots in the industry for for decades, and uh, I'm afraid the solution is still not there. And um, there, there's been quite a lot of research and increasing those days, those recent years about uh, addressing white spots. Um, there is very good promise in, in some of those technology, but they are still not really uh, ready uh, to, be, to be implemented for several reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is um, the um, oral delivery of some of these uh, substances. Uh, so it's a lot about technology making the best vehicle to get the product stable in the feed and then uh, readily really in, 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 the, in, in the gut uh, of, the, of the frames. So that's still uh, a struggle. There are companies, startup companies, working on that with, uh, with very good progresses, but uh, still uh, there is a lot to be done on this. The second point is the regulation. Because uh, you may have seen, you know, aquaculture, I think there is a lot of biotechnology, a lot of work that is being done at the moment. Uh, no complex of inferiority versus uh, land, uh, land animals, uh, definitely. Uh, but regulation is a, is a challenge in some, in some cases because we are dealing a lot with uh, uh, genetic modification to produce some of those substances. And uh, as you know, uh, any territory, there is still concern and uh, and question uh, around the acceptance of those of those technology. Even if we are dealing with uh, inactivated uh, products that will not disseminate the, the, the modified genes in the, in the environment, in the environment, it's still it's still a question mark. So uh, those two technological limitation and regulation makes really the development and the implementation of white spot uh, challenge uh, technologies uh, a little bit difficult today. On the other side, uh, you mentioned other issues uh, associated to shrimp and, uh, production, such as uh, you know, the meiosis, uh, parasites, DHP, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, what I can tell you is that uh, we and others uh, have been working, investing in, in, in research to develop, uh, to develop solutions which are not drugs, uh, so we are talking about uh, here, you know, making the animal um, more, more resistant and that's sensitive to, the, to those, uh, those pathogens. Um, there are good results obtained, uh, and uh, this now has to be uh, transferred all the way to the, to the industry. And one of the challenges with shrimps is really to, uh, you know, farmers like to use a lot of input on the farm, uh, so they like, you know, to, to see the product, to, to mix it with their feed and so on. So uh, this is probably one of the limits of the, of the functional feed per se. Uh, so still a lot of work to do with our customers, the feed companies, uh, to demonstrate to farmers really the, the, the value uh, of those of those concepts versus uh, uh, the, the classical applications they, 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 they may use in their farms. So moving on to sustainability, because I, obviously these uh, these all intersect, and Isla, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to you. There's not a lot of uh, of retail buyers that have degrees in in uh, marine biology, so you kind of have a, a little bit of a of an extra uh, extra leg up on these issues. But um, to what extent now uh, have retailers um, begun to to question and be uh, more interested in what's happening in the in the uh, feed side of the supply chain. Certainly, over the past few years, there's um, there's been a lot of uh, a lot of retailers that have um, partnered up with feed uh, companies on um, particularly on novel ingredients, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but to to what extent now is this is this on the radar of retailers and who is driving that? Is it the consumer? Is it ESG concerns? Um, I think it's a bit of a mixture of things. Feeds certainly become a really hot topic. Um, I'd say in the last couple of years, especially, um, and it's something that we're talking about more and more uh, as a business ourselves. I think part of that is um, due to consumers. I think people are becoming more and more interested in where their food comes from now and how it's produced. Um, and we've seen that reflected 
you know, in the media. So there's been some quite high profile NGO campaigns, for example, Greenpeace have campaigned around soy um, and there's been several reports about marine ingredients. And I do think that makes retailers sit up and listen when they, they know that feed is being talked about in the public domain. Um, also, David Attenborough, you know, on his latest documentary, specifically linked environmental destruction in South America with feed ingredients coming into the UK. And I know that was, that was a talking point. Um, so, yeah, I think um, consumer interest is definitely one part of it. And also, you know, when someone comes and buys a product from us, they expect us to ensure that that's been responsibly sourced and that, you know, anything to do with that supply chain isn't having negative impacts um, either on people or, or the environment. So I think a lot of it is down to the fact that, you know, retailers have responsible sourcing policies and we actually want to live them. It's, it's not just kind of PR for us anymore. We want to ensure that when we're saying that something has been responsibly sourced and we're, we're trying to do the right thing, that we actually are trying to do that. Yeah, you know, issues like the Amazon soy and deforestation obviously have, have you know, made the headline news and that's uh, something that salmon farmers have certainly uh, worked to address. Uh, Piers, just going to you, I'm coming at it from uh, the certification and, and the NGO perspective. When did, um, you've been involved in aquaculture stewardship council standards, um, when uh, did feed really start to um, kind of hit on the supply chain as a as kind of a weak point because it does seem like there's been a lot more focus on uh on feed certifications as isla mentioned among retailers and consumers um and among farmers themselves well it's been an interesting journey because uh, when, when i first started working with wf which was about 12 years ago i would the main thing we were working on was the asc standards we were developing the standards and obviously a big thing, part of that was the marine ingredients and how to certify marine ingredients and ensure they were coming from sustainable fisheries. But as time went on, and as I said, that was 12 years ago, um, really the work got more and more concentrated on feed because it wasn't just the marine ingredients at that point. It became uh, was a sort of realization that in fact, although soy originally was, uh, was seen as a, um, you know, a positive replacement, we, can, well, we, we don't need all that. Uh, marine ingredients we can replace it with soy and, and uh, canola oil but actually now that's part of a much bigger environmental issue which involves our whole planet and so um yes yeah, it's, it's definitely changed uh, and i would say about well really about five years ago interestingly enough we started developing the um, feed standards for asc and again we were all we spent ages working on the marine ingredients side of it developed a really nice process for um uh certifying marine ingredients using different certification schemes and tiers and, and different levels of sustainability. And then we started working on the feed side of it, on the, sorry, the terrestrial side of it, and, and it became much more difficult. It's suddenly much more difficult dealing with terrestrial ingredients from all over the world where um, uh, the traceability is almost non-existent for some um, products and, and it becomes much more complicated, but it's some, and, and therefore a much bigger thing. But, not only that, but it became, we, we realized then that actually we were dealing not just with salmon and shrimps and uh, marine fish and whatever, we were, actually dealing, we were actually talking about the livestock industry in general. And we we're talking about ingredients for poultry and pigs and, uh, and to certain extent cattle. And, uh, and now, so now my, my job in fact is now working on um, feed ingredients for livestock, which is very different for me, but because the overlap is so huge and because it involves global commodities and monoculture um raw materials uh yeah so that's really where we are now and, and in fact try, trying to diversify the uh potential ingredients for animal feeds is what we're working on now which is why we're so involved in um innovation and why i'm working with project x and feed x and I, actually i was going to also mention a, a bit of a success story in that um line with uh, algal oil which i think is a really uh, exciting development in that it works very much on, from a fish, fish health perspective, uh, providing um, healthier fish, but also uh, healthier for people. And it enables uh, the re reduction in the amount of fish oil that's required, um, which can then be replaced with something cheaper like canola oil. But um, I would like to, yeah, one day hopefully we'll see it used in a, a, even more uh, extensively, but it's, uh, I think that's a real breakthrough for human health 
uh, development of innovative feed ingredients and for fish health. That's a perfect lead into our, our novel ingredients and our uh, alternative ingredients topic. But before we move on to that, Elizabeth, what from Biomar's perspective, from a, a feed uh, a feed perspective, which of the ingredients are causing the most challenges uh, right now? I'm assuming that that soy is a is a big challenge on the purchasing side. But um, what are feed companies uh, really doing to ensure the integrity of that supply chain, uh, ensuring the health of that supply chain? Um, recent study, I think it came out of Nofema, uh, that uh, uh, pesticides were um, were at, at not high levels, but were being found in in, uh, in salmon because it's being included in the, um, you know, it's be, being used in, in soy and plant-based uh, uh, raising of, of plants and crops and kind of making its way into the feed. So what what is Biomar and the, the feed industries um, kind of main focus on ensuring that integrity and ensuring that um, the, the traceability of, of the supply chain of ingredients? Yeah, um, we have our own um, biosustain team. Uh, so we have been working with sustainability for a while and established a whole tool around it, a whole concept around it. And it's not my expertise area, but we do have skilled people working in it. And, and, and uh, we have customers that are so um, conscious and aware of this because they're as well they're targeting they're targeting customers that uh, they're targeting customers that really would like um, the best diet the best fish and this and the certification following the fish out there in the market so uh, so uh, so we can we can uh, screen and we can track down our raw materials back to the farm and to the field where we are getting the raw materials um, being soy or others and you, you asked me what is the biggest concern about raw materials you know uh, um the marine side because hmm. you know, we know that fish having the fish health background i know that EPA and DHA is something that we get from the oceans and the fish needs it. It's very much linked to health. And Carl, and, yeah. oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, so, so, so being able to, to find new sources of these marine ingredients like Pierce said, um, looking at algae uh, for example and krill these low traffic uh, sources. It's um, yeah. And Harold, that was the, the first thing that you uh, that you mentioned when when you uh, opened the panel was um, the politics of blue lighting, the challenges that that's caused. How much more um, are the producers themselves hearing about the sustainability of the of the feed supply chain? Has this become an issue now? Um, when facing the retailers and and and, and when um, just in discussions about raising the fish, has the sustainability of feed become uh, a more important topic? It definitely has become a, a much more important uh, topic. Uh, and but at the same time, I'm a bit um, uncertain if that is coming from the end consumer, you and me or the retailers, just to have something to discuss and bargain on. Uh, but I agree with Elizabeth, it's, it's the blue white thing, MSC certification that is the biggest uh, challenge at the moment. All of the feed stuff, all of the feed raw materials has full traceability and we can take it back to, to the farmers, as, as Elizabeth is saying, and, and uh, every serious producer of, of uh, farmed aquatic animals should have that system in, in, in place. The issue about soy, I think we have sold that. We, we have done what we can do. We are using certificated soy produced not in the Amazon uh, biome, but much farther, farther south. And it's at the end of the day, it's a bit limit uh, pressure. We as a very small soy buyer can, can can put on the so big soy producers but the marine raw materials is 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 of great uh, concern and 
uh, Leroy, together with Bioma, was the first first mover regarding uh, microalgae uh, EPA DHA, uh, and we implemented and have been implementing for last four or five years. 25% uh, of all of our EPA DHA in, in all of the salmon diets. So, and and that costs um, three times more than EPA DHA from from fish oil, but uh, it's a chicken and egg situation. Someone has to be the first mover, and Lere has to be a chosen to be the first mover on, on that issue. But is getting that? Do we have got that money back? I don't think so. So, yeah, we. It's a question about marketing. Our marketing department, how uh, then girls are marketing this, how the retailers are marketing marketing this, and so on. But I also want to say that. We are now working with new raw, marine raw materials as um, yes, as a fish meal re replacer. We're talking about well, krill as Biomar is working with uh, um, copper pods and blue mussel proteins. We have had actually a um, quite interesting breakthrough in how to produce blue mussel protein in industrial scale, and then we're talking many tons per per, per hour. So, so uh, things are happening and, and uh, going down in the food web, uh, using low trophic species as the main uh, feeds uh, raw materials, low trophic species that we are not eating today or not giving to the cows or pigs or whatever um, animal we are, we are feeding. I think that's the one of the way we are, we are going and, and we're doing that together with, with the feed uh, suppliers, with the feed companies with their R&D departments. Uh, and I think we have a very good collaboration with the feed suppliers. This is not a, a feed supplier on one fence and the animal, uh, the salmon producer on the other fence. We are really on the same same field here. Well, I'm glad you brought up marine ingredients because I think that um, oftentimes that is overlooked. Some of the uh, potential options in marine ingredients, whether it's byproducts or, uh, as you said, other uh, other species in the uh, different parts of the uh, of the uh, value chain. There, um, Piers, you've worked a lot on uh, with Project X on finding alternative ingredients and. I mean, it's every day that seems like there's a new startup, uh, whether it's insects, single cell proteins, uh, uh, rapeseed oil, um, you know, it, it, there, there's so many different alternatives out there. But what I oftentimes hear from uh, producers or feed companies is, okay, this is great, this is exciting. How on earth do you scale this, for one? And for two, how do you maintain uh, omega threes, which in particular with salmon, if you don't have that, then you really do have a marketing problem, like Harold uh, hinted at. Well, omega three is the issue I, I um, mentioned earlier. Really, we, we, I think I, I feel into the future it's solved. It can be solved with microalgae, which is a little bit more expensive. But, but considering when I first looked at microalgae myself uh, about ten years ago, it was ten times the price it is now. So the price has come down dramatically. And of course, fish oil prices have gone up. So, and fish meal prices will go up as well because they're limited resources. And so, once they become over overused, they uh, they go up in price, supply and demand. But um, we're we're now looking at um, well, uh, sorry, going back to your question, um, uh, FeedX has basically uh, gone uh, 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 put out an application for people to uh, innovators to apply and they, they received something like 80 different innovations, innovative companies that were looking at when they were starting up, producing all sorts of things in all sorts of ways. And we um, picked out 10 based on uh, a number of uh, criteria which are now being developed by splitting. But absolutely, that's the, the key is to accelerate the, the uh, growth of these, of the ones that are uh, potentially useful. And it's basically insect meals, um, uh, fermentation uh, products, um, algae, yeast, and uh, single cell organisms, uh, sorry, sorry, yeasts, and so and they produce proteins and oils. So there's all sorts of things out there, but the, the real issue always is going to be the cost and how to get that down, which you hope to by scaling up, but also some of them also have certain functional advantages, like uh, algal oil. You can pay a little bit more because it contains DHA, which is incredibly valuable. 
Um, I think also some of the other meals will provide better gut health than soy in feeds and may well have a, uh, you may well, may well be worth paying a little bit extra cost for uh, lower mortalities or better ability to fight sea lice. So, I mean, all these things come together and uh, I think some of these innovative new materials, if they can be produced cheaply enough, not necessarily as cheaply as soy, but down to, will, will be able to be included to maybe, I mean, not to replace soy, nobody's saying that, but to add, add alternatives for feed uh, producers to go to and say, look, we can add a little bit of this and it'll help with uh, fish health, or we can add a little bit of this and it'll help with coloration or whatever, I don't know. I mean, all sorts of functional properties, but um, but it means that uh, soy will, instead of, instead of being the, the only, we're well, pretty much the only ingredient they can turn to soy and maize uh, outside of uh, fish meal, they've got a whole range of different uh, uh, alternative ingredients that give different functional um, opportunities, potential. So, you know, I, I see the, the challenge here, right? Is that, uh, as you said, Piers, it's a chicken, it's a chicken and the egg mm -hmm. issue. Um, because everyone across the value chain maybe understands that there will need to be um, higher costs for these uh, more functional ingredients or these alternatives. Um, but Isla, I'm going to go to you on this because what we've seen a lot of, whether it's ingredient producers or feed producers, um, actually leapfrogging um, the uh, salmon farmers or um, uh, farmers themselves coming to retailers and saying hey you should use this ingredient um while that's exciting um and i see harold smiling about that so i think he may have some thoughts on this as well well that's exciting um so whose responsibility is it then to actually get more money out of this and do consumers even care or are they going to see uh, a slab of beautiful salmon lying there uh on the fresh case and say well this one is 20% uh, more than this one, and I don't understand why. So what role do the retailers need to play in this to, to push that message to consumers? And um, I think it's me. a really good Wasn't question. Oh, do, you want, do you want to answer? Uh, Harold, I, uh, well, uh, I'm sure, no, hopefully you'll agree with some of, some of this, but um, I think it's a really interesting question and one that um, we could debate a lot, but. For me, I think collaboration is, is really, really important. So yes, we've had really exciting conversations with innovators um, as well as you know other, other people in the supply chain, but I really think that having this conversation as a group would really help to address this problem um, of who's going to pay for it. Um, I think consumers, the main drivers for them are quality and price. And there's various kind of consumer research that's been done into how much consumers will pay for sustainability. But whether or not that translates into actual sales, I think is is a bit of a debate still. So, um, you know, we're one quite small retailer in the UK, but if we as a group of retailers can agree on actually this is what we want to see from the feed industry and, and from the salmon sector, for example, I think that could be really powerful and that could really help to kind of pull through uh, sustainable alternatives to add to the feed basket and um, improve the sustainability of traditional ingredients as well. Um, Harold, I don't know if you want to add to that as well. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's a very interesting question because we, um, at one side, we are really pushing for new raw materials. We have been uh, first mover for camalina oil, insects meal, uh, Algae, microalgae oil we have been t talking about. We have a higher EPA DHA level than most salmon producers in Norway and, and so on and so on. But at the same time, we have to remember who is our competitor. Is it uh, Grig, Salmark, Movi, or the other salmon producers? Or is the chicken and beef industry? Mm. Because if we start to fight too heavily internally, it's uh, we are spending all our resources and energy on fighting other salmon producers while we should uh, have a competition with with uh, uh, beef producers so in one way we have to drive and be a, a, a discussion partner and a pusher for the feed industry and the raw materials industry and we definitely have taken a position there but we have to be a bit careful not to 
spend all of energy fighting our neighbor. But uh, and and we also have to be careful that uh, in this uh, the case the feed supplier has to take responsibility for the whole product, the whole feed, the whole feed pellet they are de de delivering. So if I'm telling Biomar or Evos or, or Scratching that yes, you have to use this raw material from that supplier because we like it, then they said okay, but then I have to take the product um, uh, quality. Uh, criteria, and I, I don't want that. So, so it's we, we have to play to, together on this, and and we've been first mover on uh, on several of these raw materials, and it's costly. And every quarter, when you go to the stock market and put forward your quarterly report, you get uh, a lot of noise because <laughs> your feed cost is too high. Well, so, yeah. Well, given that, so Mathieu, just asking you that that's part of your uh, challenge or part of the challenge for Lalaman, right? Is just say, hey, you need to add these ingredients uh, because it's going to add to efficiency. It's going to improve fish health. It's going to mitigate losses. So how receptive are, are aquaculture producers to that message? And what do you need to do to uh, get that message through when you hear the cost pressures that Harold was mentioning and that Isla was mentioning? Well, first of all, I like to, to, to distinguish the uh, feed materials or, you know, the macronutrient source we are talking about, protein, lipids, whatever, uh, and the feed additive types, because uh, we are not talking about the same thing. Uh, so I will focus more on the alternative raw material, so protein, lipids, uh, et cetera. So uh, as pointed out by Pierce, I mean, fermented uh, technology can be, can be of help. Uh, combined, of course, with uh, selected downstream processing technologies to make the ingredients uh, really digestible and uh, palatable for, for the animals. So that's also something that has to be taken into consideration. And of course, yes, the big question are uh, the affordability of, of those technologies and uh, the scale up uh, and the cost. And uh, I, would, I would like to say that even though l'Allemand has been mainly focusing on micro ingredients, uh, we are looking at, at this now, and um, definitely we have to be careful because the cost factor is not only an issue for the potential users, it's also internally in our organization an issue because we have competition for, you know, uh, production capabilities versus other potential applications, you know, in the food sector or in the biotech uh, arena, etc. So this is also an internal competition for the, for the resource. You see what I mean? Um, so I, I think nobody has already found the perfect equation to put those, you know, uh, single cell protein uh, ingredients uh, at the right, uh, say, price and uh, producing in larger volume. Hopefully, we will see uh, development uh, coming soon. We talk a lot and we hear, we read about micro, uh, bacterial, bacterial meal. Uh, that, that is probably one to look at uh, quite carefully in, in, in months, years to come. Um, on the on the yeast side, um, there is still quite a lot of work to to reduce the cost down. Uh, this is definitely one of the challenge we we have uh, taken. Um, and one of the big issue is not only the scaling up for us; it's it's really the, the competition. You know, uh, where you extract more value at the end of the day. Uh, if you have to produce, you know, a uh, protein uh, a yeast with a 60 plus uh, food protein uh, percent, uh, well, uh, the food sector may pay uh, probably uh, 10 times more than what the feed sector is, is going to pay in short term. So that's that's a consideration we you have to integrate in the equation. Well, right, because uh, in particular, you could say with uh, marine uh, proteins as well, that there's pressure on um, uh, reduction fisheries for uh, human consumption, for example. So there is a lot of competition for all these ingredients. Um, Elizabeth, uh, tell us a bit, you know, especially having heard uh, Harold discuss about the pressures on costs, when you look at all these um, different potential ingredients, um, again, it's exciting. Uh, you know, obviously there is a future for these alternative ingredients, whether it's um, soon or, or later. 
Um, which ones from your view hold the most promise? And what I mean by that is which ones actually do you feel are going to meet the criteria of commercialization, of costs, of meeting those uh, the, the need for omega-3s? Um, which ones really stand out? Because there are so many alternatives uh, and, and so much uh, fanfare made about it. But which ones really stand out to you as having real potential for the aquaculture industry? I think we are we are we are constantly searching uh, for new raw materials um, and um, and having new raw materials it demands uh, quite an extensive development uh, to get to the level that it can be used at a cost efficient level. Um, we are we have as Harold said we have been using algae for a while. In combination with with krill, all these low trophic, and so we have good experience with that, and we can actually produce fish that where we don't have to feed fish, we can feed other marine ingredients. So um, so that is possible. We have shown that already, but but saying that we are looking into other things all the time. Um, one of the questions we always have to ask because we we are getting contacted by suppliers with great ideas with new raw materials they want to, to test it they want to, to to do some tests together with us um, but we always have to ask the question how big is the volume because when we are thinking about when we are thinking about salmon production that's just one thing and then but we have a, we are serving the global you know we're serving shrimp and marine fish uh, all over the world but just looking into the salmon production, it's enormous volume of feed. So if we are going to use that, we have to, the suppliers need, need to have that in mind. Are they able to supply us with the quantities that, we, that, that our industry actually needs? So I'm going to press you, Pierce, on this because that's been a, a big part of the effort of Project X and WWF is in encouraging this development, encouraging this innovation, but ultimately a scale is a big, big issue. Um, you hit on it a little bit earlier, but um, you know, uh, algae also needs inputs, right? It doesn't just grow on its own. You, you need scale. You need places to grow it, um, and sometimes you need sugar or you know whatever whatever's being used for um, something like algae and the same for all these other ingredients there there there's a footprint for these ingredients as well um, so from your view um, which of these that that you're uh, that you've been working on at project X and and just from your history which ones hold the most promise right now if you were to be able to to tell the aquaculture industry Hey, this is going to have some real impact. This is going to really be something you'll see more and more in the supply chain in the coming years. I think um, fermentation is going to be the key in the end, and it'll be. Um, I, but I don't know. It's difficult to tell, actually. I, I don't. I, I, my, my longer-term view has always been around seaweed, actually, because I think seaweed is one thing you can grow in bulk, but it can't be used as feed really very well. It's not very good. So. Um, my long, my real long-term view, actually, is that that seaweeds and they're fermented into proteins and oils, not proteins mainly, is um, is possibly long-term key to the future. But but there's an in-between stage, and I don't really know how we're going to get there. It, it's um, it is a it's a challenge. It's uh, how to scale up these processes, uh, which obviously cost a lot of money, and and people need to be able, people need to buy them, or somebody needs to pay for the scale up without. Um, the product actually being used. I mean, there's got to be some sort of intermediary stage. And I guess we're trying to do that with uh, FeedX, uh, working with Scretting at the moment, a um, big feed company. Um, and uh, the main thing that excites me about it is uh, the fact that the, the basic process is to raise funds for the, for the upscaling. So, so there's a combination of a, of a feed uh, company and possibly more feed companies in the future. Um, there's, there's all the innovators. And all their fantastic technology, and then there's money, and money is obviously the key to everything. So um, it's those, it's that combination of three that has led me to continue to support FeedX. Um, 
I, I, yeah, but I, it's a challenge. It really is a challenge, but it's something that has to be, we have to get around it in some way because there's basically a limited amount of land on this planet. There's a limited amount of fresh water on this planet. And at some point it's going to run out. And actually we need to use that land to grow food for people. We need to use the water for that. But we need to find out ways to, to do that. Um, and this is my small, the small way where I feel I can have some sort of contribution. And I, and I think um, novel fees may, may, might be a big, uh, big, um, part of how we solve some of these problems. And, you know, I think Harold said it very well, the, the competition isn't between, you know, Movi and Leroy and, and uh, Grieg necessarily, it's between uh, aquaculture and land-based uh, proteins. Um, and it seems to me, I'm biased because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, writing about the seafood industry and have been in it a long time, but it does seem that ESG um issues have begun to shift a bit um and and open open um minds a bit more toward aquaculture and isla do you see that uh happening more that um that retailers are beginning to maybe see aquaculture in a slightly different light and does that somehow help with that message of here's why you might choose uh seafood here's why you might choose this salmon fed with algae, um, maybe because of the health benefits, but also because it's maybe a more sustainable option. Um, yeah, uh, well, I'm probably also extremely biased um, towards seafood, so I will, I will caveat that answer with this, but it's really, it is really interesting, actually. Um, I sit in a team of, of people that work on terrestrial agriculture species and work with our farmers, um, and you know, Piers said earlier, actually, when you talk about feed, you know, there's lots of commonalities across the different sectors. And I think uh, aquaculture is definitely kind of having these conversations around feed sustainability a lot more than some of the terrestrial sectors, I think, is the first thing. And, and actually, for things like marine ingredients and soy has done a lot of work already around getting, you know, certified material in place, which is great. Um, and but yeah, I do think people are starting to look at fish and seeing it as a more sustainable process. Oh, Harold, you're frozen. Oh, Oops, I think we lost Certainly you. in the last couple of years when we've heard lots of um, discussion in the media, themes around climate change. Oops. Sorry, um, I'm not sure when. I, I was just saying that oh, the last are. couple of years in particular, we've you know heard a lot around climate change and emissions and... Um, the, the meat industry and, and dairy have been kind of um, uh, blamed in terms of a lot of the noise around climate change, but seafood actually is something that I think people are turning to if they want to eat a more sustainable protein. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for positive messages around you know, the lower carbon footprint of seafood. And also I think there's positive messages around feed ingredients and responsible sourcing throughout the supply chain in aquaculture. So I'd really, really like to see kind of these positive stories coming through a lot more. Well, Isla, I think because you're outnumbered, I think everybody is is looking at the retail sector to actually get this more money so that everyone can start adding these exciting ingredients. So you're on the spot for, for, every, for the rest of the people here. So we are running out of time. Uh, unfortunately, um, my colleague Demi has been monitoring the Q&As. Um, Demi, I, I believe that you can hop on and uh, uh, like I said, we're running out of time, but if there's a, a question or two that uh, came in that um, might be interesting for one of the panelists, uh, please ask it. Sure. Uh, so we, we got a lot of questions uh, fielded in, but I'm just going to ask one question for the sake of time. Um, so this question is directed to both Elizabeth and Harold. Um, when we look at salmon, the first thing that comes to mind, obviously, is omega-3 levels. Um, so just examining the reduction in those omega-3 levels over the decade, uh, how uh, would those alternative feed ingredients change that? Elizabeth? Yeah, well, um, almost go, uh, giving it back to you, Harold, but it's, uh, yeah. I think you have shown that it's possible. Lele has shown that it's possible because Lele is actually both uh, looking into alternative ingredients, not depending on, on fish, as a raw material source, but in the same time being conservative in the levels of EPA and DHA on, in their feeds. 
so it compared to uh, the levels that we have in, in Norway. So I think it's possible. Yeah. If, if you if you look at uh, at the graphs on the EPA DHA level in in the farm salmon over the last ten years, it's a decline. Uh, and then people are saying, oh, you are, um, this product is not as good as it was. The the truth is that ten years ago the level was unnatural high because we used only fish oil. And if you compare it with wild salmon, which you, you, you should do, today the level of EPA, DHA in gram, weight in gram, not percentages, uh, is more or less equal. At the same time, there has been re uh, recently reports saying that, okay, if you're increasing uh, the EPA, DHA level in the diet, uh, or by that in the fish, a bit, you get a bit uh, better fish health. You get a fish that is more resistant to stress and viruses and, and uh, bacterial di di diseases. So, so yes, why don't we do it? Well, it's a cost issue again. And, and I think uh, uh, some of the issues here that have been raised, what is this microalgae, what is this insects well, uh, and, uh, and uh, bacterials that with them you are farming for producing proteins? What are they growing on? At? What what type of resources are they using for 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 growing for, into a protein source or into a fat source? And that's one one of the reasons why we are focusing on on uh, uh, seaweed and blue mussels because they don't use fresh water, they don't use land, they don't use pesticides, they don't use use feed at all because they find everything in in the nature. So if you're really looking into to the future, uh, what is the um, raw material of the future, you should look into these types of, of species that are uh, fed by by the nature itself. And looking into the marine ingredients, like alternative marine ingredients, we get access to these very much needed uh, fatty acids, the omega-3s for the fish. And it's it's one of the best uh, ingredients, uh, or the best, um, the positive sides with, with the salmon or the fish as a, as a food source, because humans as well need omega threes. So, so, so it's a it's a healthy food. So we would like to keep it in there. Well, and there was one other issue. Sorry, there's one other issue with, with vegetable proteins. They're all lacking one or more amino amino acids, which you then had to add to, to the diet. While mar marine protein sources have all the necessary amino acids present. Thanks. So thanks, Demi, and, and I'll start to wrap it up. Uh, unfortunately, we need another we need another hour, but uh, we'll we'll follow up and we'll we'll do it another time. But um, I'm going to put you all on the spot for just very quickly for the sake of time. If you were to say the number one ingredient or number one issue rather that the, the feed industry should be focused on right now. Um, Mathieu, what would you say that is? And I'll just go around and ask that same question of everyone. Where should the attention really be focused right now? I think uh, I like the idea of uh, improving the, the diversification of the, of the ingredients we are using and looking at the synergy those can, can, can bring in terms also of fish health, because people have been looking at those alternatives, you know, in silo separately, but there, there is probably a lot of synergy to explore. So I think short term, I don't believe uh, we we'll find the magic uh, raw material that will totally replace everything. So uh, I think going for a combination of um, several novel uh, ingredients is the direction to take, and looking at the synergies between those in terms of fish shells uh, is, is, is probably uh, an important uh, avenue. Elizabeth, where, where would you say the number one issue needs to be uh, right now, the, the, the attention for the feed industry? Well, I think we always have to lean forward. Uh, we have to keep on exploring. Uh, we need to understand what the requirements are for the fish and how we can um, su supply that in the best way and a cost efficient way. Um, and saying that a little bit where we started discussions is having room for this innovation. So we need to have room to be able to develop these things. And I don't think we can do it alone either. So we are depending on having this, um, like all these people in this panel actually, 
we can all contribute together to to mm. uh, to, to get to the next step and to yeah to have a, a good good feed uh, suited for for future farming mm. but how yeah, but health is important. I'm, I'm saying it, health. <laughs> we have to keep the fish alive and well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, keeping the fish alive. It's that that does seem like a pretty important issue. So, um, but uh, Pierre, same question to you. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. How do, how to accelerate growth of the novel ingredients? Um, I mean, we've, we've identified lots of them, but how do we accelerate the growth of them in order to reduce the cost and increase the uptake? Um, that's it's the key thing. And I, I guess a lot of us are working on it at the moment, trying to get people to work together. Um, but that's it. It's, it's how to how to reduce the cost by increasing growth and uptake. Harold, where where would you uh, say the the industry needs to focus when it comes to feed? <clears throat> well, I can I can of course repeat what the other said, but let's go back to the MSC certification of the blue white thing because the politics that's politic that has nothing to do with our us as fish farmer or biomauri was as a, as a fish producer because we all ask for MSC certificated blue whitings but it's the politics of the coastal states that destroy that uh, that certification so so it's it's something by by talk to talk and walk the walk um, and it's not the industry that is the bad guys here it's the politics that can't really agree on which direction to walk Harold, I thought we agreed you weren't going to bring up politics. That's why that's why I'm here. I don't want to be thinking about politics, but okay. <laughs> well, probably enlarging, enlarging this comment to uh, regulatory uh, bodies as well, because uh, this is also something we didn't touch today, but uh, if we were to bring those novel ingredients and or additives, uh, sometimes uh, regulatory uh, people would have to, to understand and to adapt the framework to those to those new ingredients because this is a serious limit in, in what we can do we can achieve uh, today in particular in europe but uh, not only in Isla, everyone's brought up really interesting points here, um, but uh, I'm going to give you the last word here. So from a retail perspective, it's being the closest to the consumer. Where do you think the feed sector should be uh, focused right now? Um, I agree with uh, the points that everyone else has made, but from my perspective, the, the number one thing we could do is to collaborate more. Um, you know, this has been great, talking to a cross-section of, of people involved in the feed and agriculture industries, but I really think the power in addressing these issues, such as scaling up or the, the blue whiting and, and novel ingredients, is certainly around collaborating throughout the supply chain. Great. Well, again, I wish we had more time because there's so many other topics, so we will do it again. Uh, and of course, you can drop uh, Interfish a line at any time if there's uh, story ideas and issues that you think we should be looking into, because it's certainly something important to the entire industry. Um, so that wraps it up. Just a quick note on December 1st and 2nd, we have another, uh, we have another digital event. It's our Seafood Investor Forum. We're really excited about that. Um, and they'll be happening over the course of two days, and we're going to have a, a fantastic group of, uh, of people there. Uh, and also, we're uh, doing some research on fish feed uh, alternative ingredients, so you can go to our website and see some of our uh, some of our reports that we're doing on that. Um, but as a final note, thank you so much to all our panelists. Thank you to our partners, BMR. Uh, thank you to Panafaird for sponsoring. And again, thank you so much to the panelists for taking the time. Uh, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Bye-bye.